So uh, we'd love to start with, uh, with AI and data. So you guys are um, incredibly active in the space. Actually, mm -hmm. I was, I was uh, just reviewing on the uh, you know, trusted Crunchbase, the, the <laughs> list of... Yeah, uh, yeah. Crunch, Crunchbase is getting a little inaccurate, but they are very good at SEO, so... Yeah, <laughs> that's half of the battle. Uh, but just like in the last like five or six months between um, new investments and follow-on, mm -hmm. like this look, long list, I was looking... Um, the list of the label box, Cresta, mm -hmm. Action IQ, which is uh, a company that we have the uh, honor of uh, sharing mm -hmm. with you guys, a uh, great company here in New York, Imply, which spoke here, yeah. uh, Neural Magic, uh, Databricks, mm -hmm. uh, which you're on the board of, Instabase, Sisu, Preset, Fivetran, Shield AI, so a long list, mm -hmm. and that's just the last like four or five months. So yeah. um, maybe to start at that high level, uh, maybe walk us through your, your investment thesis around AI and why you're so excited about this space? Yeah, sure. So we kind of think of it as a um, a very kind of powerful new tool on how to work with computers. That's a good an analogy would be if you think of conventional programming like um, deductive reasoning, and then AI as inductive reasoning. So if you think about doing math and you only had deductive logic. There's a whole class of problems you could never solve. And uh, that's definitely the case with AI. And it's on the order of as important as <laughs> deductive math, as, as important as conventional programming. Um, and so, of course, the first things that are getting solved with AI uh, end up being um, things that you couldn't solve with conventional programming or very easily uh, or at all. Um, but over time, what we're finding is some things are just easier to do in AI than conventional programming. So it's a very, very big space. Um, and there's a whole giant set of new problems that, that can be solved. And then a whole, and you can see it in our investments, a rather robust tool chain that needs to be developed um, so that you can work in AI much more easily and, and effectively than you can today, which is still kind of early days. Mm -hmm. And I heard your partner, uh, Mark Andreessen, um, talk about this topic, and he was uh, contrasting uh, the question of, is AI a feature versus is AI a new architecture? Mm -hmm. um, so you guys presumably fall in the architecture Well, side. yeah, yes, I mean, you know, because as I said, it, it, it's sort of a whole new problem-solving technique. It's in the same domain <laughs> as, uh, as programming, um, but it's, you know, it takes a different, uh, you know, a probably approximately correct approach as opposed to kind of, uh, you know, a step-by-step a, a -step approach. And it, um, and it just turns out that there's many things that we can do now that were, were very, very difficult to do before. And we're getting, uh, you know, we had the amazing breakthroughs in image recognition, you know, starting around 2012, and we're kind of hitting a new point with natural language processing now that's very similar um, and there's just no way to get the kinds of results that we're getting with conventional programming so mm. it's a big big space that mm. doesn't mean that there weren't there won't be ai features there will be but yep. uh, it's certainly bigger than that yep. and any um thoughts on where the specific opportunities are, are you more investors in the in the tool chain as you mentioned or mm -hmm. on the ai driven applications does it not matter yeah, well, you know, anything with high impact, I think that uh, we're very interested in. So the, I think there's a lot of very interesting areas in infrastructure now because the things built with the original tools are just not going to be as good yeah. as the things built with the next generation tools. Um, and so building the next generation tools is, is quite exciting and probably the you know, one of the best companies that we're, that I'm involved in is a company called Databricks, which is a sort of foundational component of AI, and uh, and just things get much much easier when you when you have tools like that. And of course, then there's workflow tools and labeling tools and um, scaling tools and, mm -hmm. and 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 on and on and on. Yep. And actually, speaking of uh, Databricks, do you want to maybe walk us through the the journey of the company, you know, this is a room full of entrepreneurs starting sure. new companies. We had a uh, Eon at this event years oh, yeah. ago. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but to maybe walk us through, for, you know, some of the people, there are technical people here, less technical people through, you know, what it is, what the investment thesis was and how it's evolved. Sure. I mean, so, so it's a, it's quite an amazing story. Um, so originally I got a call from, uh, 
Scott Schenker is a professor at Berkeley, and he said, Ben, you know, we have a guy here who's best distributed systems guy we've seen in academia in the last decade, and that was Matei, who is the kind of CTO there. Um, and uh, so I was like, okay, I'm interested. That was a good pitch. Uh, <laughs> And they had built this thing called Spark. Um, and the, uh, the simple way to think of Spark is it's sort of, you know, Hadoop was always a good idea, but a really horrible piece of software for anybody who tried to use it. It was hard to program, it was hard to deploy, it was just a pain in the ass. And, and Spark was like the good version of that built by somebody who, who like a better architect. And that, that was Matei. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, and that was what it was to begin with, and they just had the open source Spark, and they were figuring out what they wanted to do. Um, there were, <laughs> so uh, Jan's idea was, okay, we'll um, make this a SaaS offering, and that, and we won't even mess with the kind of open source distribution. We won't do anything on-prem, which was in 2013 was kind of a big deal in that it was thought then that, well, your data is, on premise, and so you need your big data tool to be on premise, and that's just the way it was going to go. Um, but by going to the cloud early, it made them much more resilient to things like Amazon offering Spark in the cloud and that kind of thing, because the Databricks solution, um, i just give you like one example. With Databricks, compute and storage were completely um, independent of one another, so you could have lots of compute going to against a little bit of storage or vice versa, and you could have the storage on premise and the compute in the cloud and all that kind of thing, whereas Amazon's solution was literally one-to-one. -one. Um, so even if Amazon gave away Spark in the cloud free, it was gonna cost you more money than Databricks because you were gonna overpay for storage or overpay for compute. And so just like that little thing was a big deal in getting them off the ground. And Ali has turned out to be probably the best CEO in the entire Andreessen Horowitz portfolio. This guy is like a phenomenon. I've never seen anything quite like him. He's built an amazing sales force. He cut a deal with Microsoft, which the Microsoft team told me is the best deal they've ever given a third party in the history of Microsoft, like that good. Um, and so it's, and he's just like this PhD in computer science. What, what but he, as, as a tangent, what, why did he become such a great CEO from this technical background? You know, he, he, is, he is a natural leader and just very good at confronting all the issues all the time. When he hired the head of sales, um, you know, we brought him like a very strong, capable head of sales. He, he kind of had that moment, you know, but he, he was learning everything that they were doing in sales. And he, and he called me up one day and he goes, Ben, like, uh, I'm a little worried about, you know, Ron and his team. And I said, well, why are you worried about them? And he says, well, they're, they're like making up products that we don't have. And I was like, well, <laughs> like, what do you mean? He said, well, like, they just sold this customer like a training package and a consulting package that we don't have. And I said, well, why do they do that? And he said, well, Ron said, the customer, you know, our product cost two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and the customer had four hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and he needed to get the rest of the money. <laughs> 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 and I'm like, Ollie, no, that's good, you know. But he would like come up with that <laughs> learning. I was like, that's enterprise software pricing. You know, how much does it cost? How much have you got? You know? <laughs> so anyway, but he 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 learned everything very fast. He's a, you know, he, his his. Uh, Uncle was a founder of OPEC, and then when the Ayatollah Khomeini uh, moved in and the, you know, the Shah got ousted, they, uh, his family was basically targeted for execution, and so he became a refugee and moved to Sweden and all that, and that whole upbringing of growing up in, it's funny because I'm friends with Quincy Jones's son, QD3, who also grew up in like a pretty bad neighborhood in Sweden, <laughs> and they lived in the same neighborhood. So they, you know, it's just a weird connection. But I knew exactly what that was, and um, you know, he, and he came up through that, and then got a PhD in computer science, and uh, became a great CEO. And a lot of it, I think, a lot of what makes you a great CEO is you understand people. And because he had such a an unusual life, he ended up meeting a lot of different kinds of people in his journey, and so he knows you know, what motivates people, like what moves them, you know, what you can do culturally, that kind of thing. Yep.
so yeah, it, it, very it, talented guy. In, interestingly to this PhD in computer science and, and, and AI um, topic, a lot of the companies that you have invested in and, and others on the team have invested mm -hmm. in actually have those very tight connections to academia. So I'm thinking of actually Eon again at uh, any, uh, mm -hmm. any scale and um, uh, the CEO of CSU, who's at Stanford, and Sebastian, right, right, Peter, uh, yeah. who's at Stanford, and, and mm -hmm. Vectra. Do, do, you, do you think that's really important? That's a big differentiating factor to have that DNA of pure research for AI and, and data structures? Well, it, dep it depends on the type of AI company that you're building, but I think that if you're, if it's not like an AI application or an AI ingredient, um, because the field is progressing so fast, it's pretty hard to build a winning company if you're not deep into the research, if you're not like fully up to speed on everything that's going on and there's a lot going on in AI right now. Um, like if you don't know the, like the latest in reinforcement learning and GANs and all that, it's pretty hard to know where the breakthrough is gonna come from. And so if you're building that kind of company, I do think you, you either need to be <laughs> a PhD from Stanford or, you know, University of Tor uh, Toronto or something, you know, like somewhere that does it, or you have to have the equivalent. And so you don't necessarily have to be in academia to be a breakthrough researcher, but, um, you know, that tends to be where a lot of them come from. Mm -hmm. And then a, a lot of, again, in your list of, of investment, a lot of mm -hmm. companies are uh, based on open source. So Spark yes. for Databricks, uh, uh, Ray for any scale and, and so on and so right forth. Through it and imply, do, yeah, yeah. do you think that's the, to the extent that there is a way, that's the way of building a successful enterprise software company these days? Well, I think that if the company has developers as the primary user, then it's pretty hard to do if you're not open source. and. Look, it's just a matter of fact in that in order to have, you know, for a developer product to work, you need developer momentum. <laughs> um, and I don't know how in 2020 you get developer momentum for a new architecture, a new API without it being open source. It just would get rejected very quickly. Now, that does mean you have to, you know, have a business model. And SaaS, SaaS turns out to be probably the, the best business model for monetizing open source. Uh, and it doesn't mean you can't ever do anything proprietary, but it's pretty hard to get developer momentum on a piece of proprietary software. I can't think of one mm -hmm. that's done it lately. Mm -hmm.